So we're going to talk about the enthalpy of solution. And here, when we're talking solution, we're really talking about the homogeneous mixture of two or more things. And so here, um, we're specifically going to talk about solids in a solvent, but it could, I mean, it could really be anything. And so here we have a solid, it's sitting in a beaker, and it could be just about anything that would be just a, a mass, a, that would have some mass to it. Um, and then we add some solvent to it. Here, maybe, could it be water, but it could be anything. And so we're looking at, when we're talking about the enthalpy of solution, we're really talking about the, um, the heat that's involved in terms of dissolving the solid into the solvent to form this solution. And so because we're at constant pressure, that enthalpy is going to, ref to really refer to the, to the heat involved in the process. And so we can think of this in a few steps. This is, this is not necessarily, they're not taking place like one at a time, but we can think of it sort of in these three steps. And so and we have our solute and it has to break apart. And so that's going to involve some um, it's going to involve, it's going to require um, some heat, some heat because, and when I say break apart, I don't necessarily mean that the molecules themselves are breaking apart, but that the molecules of the solute are, you're breaking IMFs and inter intermolecular forces between the molecules. And so that because you're breaking these interactions, that's going to require heat. So it's going to be an endo it's, it's going to be an endothermic process because you are needing heat. Um, here, I'll write endothermic here as well. Um, same with the solvent. We, we need to, um, it has to break apart in order for it to interact with the solute. And so we're also going to require some energy in order for that to take place. And so both of these processes are going to be endothermic. Um, and they're always going to be endothermic, although the magnitude is going to depend on the different types of solute or solvents, just because they all going, they're going to have different intermolecular forces. And then we have the solvent, which because we're now forming interactions with between the solute and the solvent, this is going to be exothermic. And so there's always going to be some release of energy with that process. Um, and so here we have two different scenarios where um, I've kept these to be the same magnitude just for the picture, but they really could change depending on um, the identity of the solute or solvent. And so we have two endothermic processes, and then we can see that the um, The mixing, this, the solute interacting with the solvent is going to be exothermic, and so we're seeing this, this change in energy. Um, but if it doesn't release enough energy, then overall it's going to come across as though it's still, it, it's the amount of it being released versus the amount of it being absorbed in order to break the solute and solvent apart means that you have a net amount, you have a net um, uh, the the the, sol the solution has a net gain of energy in terms of uh, the and which we'll, and so we'll call this the enthalpy of solution um, and so we see that it's going to be an endothermic process just because the heat released compared to the amount of heat that's been used um, is the, the amount of heat released is smaller than the amount of heat that's being used. Um, on the other hand, if we're talking about an exothermic process, you know, we have our, it's absorbing some amount of energy because of breaking the solute and solvent apart. But if the, the amount of energy that's being released is more than that, then you have an overall um, release of energy. And so then you have a uh, exothermic process because overall you're releasing more energy than you were absorbing through the process. And so practically speaking, what does this mean? So let's go back to our beaker in some solvent. Um, as you add your solvent, if this were endothermic, 
then you're absorbing energy that means that it's going to get colder. But if it's exothermic, because you're releasing more energy, it's going to feel hotter. And so the beaker really would change temperatures. And there are a number of substances that are endothermic or exothermic, depending on you know what they are. So now we can go, we can actually calculate the magnitude of the enthalpy. And so we have this scenario. Let's say we have a solution that's prepared by adding 3.9979 grams of sodium hydroxide to 100 mils of water. The temperature of the water is initially at 24.99 degrees Celsius and ends up at 30.05 degrees Celsius. And so we need to determine the molar enthalpy of solution for the sodium hydroxide. And so let's sort of take a look at what we have. We have the mass of the sodium hydroxide. We know that we are using 100 mils of water. We have the initial temperature of the water. We have the final temperature of the water. And then we know that it's sodium hydroxide. And so because we're talking about heat, we can go back to our equation here where heat is equal to the mass of our substance times the heat capacity um, times the change in temperature. And so I've ha I have this set up for the water um, where we have 100 mils of water. And because um, we'll start with the water because it's what we know. Um, but the 100 mils of water, we can convert to grams using the density. And so this will really allow us to calculate the grams of the water. We have the heat capacity of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, which means that for every one gram of water, in order to raise it one degree Celsius, we need 4.184 joules of energy. And so, um, and so this gives us a, a, a way to, and this, so this gives us this is our heat capacity for the water. And then we have our temperature change and our temperature change will be the final temperature minus the initial temperature. And so we've done final temperature minus the initial temperature. We plug this into a calculator, we get the number 20, uh, we, and so we see that for the, the water, it has gained 2,110.75 um, not gained. It, there's there's 2,110.75 joules of energy involved with the water because, yes, it, it has absorbed um, that much energy in order to raise the temperature that much. So that means that that is, because the water has absorbed it, that means that it's the, the sodium hydroxide had to have released it when it dissolved. So we add the negative sign to show that it was the one releasing the energy. We know that this was for 3.9979 grams of sodium hydroxide. And so we can use the molecular weight of the sodium hydroxide in order to get it into molar enthalpy solution, which we want joules per mole. And so that would be negative 21.17 joules per mole, which we can convert to kilojoules per mole just for a simpler unit. And so overall, the enthalpy of solution for sodium hydroxide, which is the heat that was involved, that was expelled by the sodium hydroxide, is negative 21.12 kilojoules per mole.